Next, we are going to look at liquidity or working capital ratios. And these ratios analyze the ability of the entity to pay its debts as and when they fall due. Now guys, when performing these calculations, unless you are specifically told otherwise, so please note they might tell you otherwise, and if you are told otherwise, you do as you are told in the question. But if the question is silent, you can calculate all of these ratios using closing balances, and you can assume that there are 365 days in a year. In addition to that, depending on the marks available, you can also calculate movements. So first, calculate all of the ratios that fall under this heading. Remember, all of the ratios are listed in the order of importance, so you start at the top and you work your way down. If you haven't performed enough calculations, Sometimes you won't be able to perform all of the calculations because there isn't enough information available in the question. So sometimes you can only perform limited calculations. However, there are more marks available. And if there are more marks available and you haven't performed enough calculations, you should then also calculate movements. So remember, how do we calculate movements? Take the current year amount, deduct the prior year, and divide by the prior year. So, what ratios fall in this category? First, you need to calculate the current ratio. Here's your interpretation. This ratio indicates the ability of the entity to settle its current liabilities as they fall due. And we calculate the current ratio by taking current assets and dividing by current liabilities. The next ratio is the quick or the acid test ratio. So here's your interpretation. This ratio indicates the ability of the entity to settle its current liabilities from assets that are either cash or quickly convertible into cash. So guys, you can see the only difference between the current ratio and the quick or acid test ratio is with the quick or asset test ratio, we deduct inventory. And the reason why we deduct inventory is inventory is the most difficult to convert into cash. Guys, think about what's normally sitting in your current assets. Current assets is normally made up of debtors, inventory, and cash and cash equivalents. Now, with the quick or acid test ratio, we are trying to determine whether the company can settle their current liabilities from assets that are either cash or quickly convertible into cash. So obviously, cash and cash equivalents is already cash. So they can use that money to settle their current liabilities. Debtors is easy to convert into cash. All you need to do is you need to collect the money from the debtor. You then have the cash, and you can use that to settle your current liabilities. However, out of all of these assets, inventory is the most difficult to convert into cash. What is the reason for that? First, you need to sell the inventory. After selling the inventory, if you are selling the inventory, obviously, on credit, the money is going to sit in debtors. So first, you need to sell the inventory. Then the money is going to sit in debtors. You don't have the money yet. You then still need to collect the money from the debtor before you can use it to settle your current liabilities. So out of all of these current assets that we have over here, inventory is the most difficult to convert into cash or it's going to take longer to convert inventory into cash. Cash is already cash. Debtors, you just need to collect the money from the data. Inventory, you first need to sell it, then you need to collect the money from the data, and only after that do you have the cash. So out of all of your current assets, inventory is the most difficult to convert to cash. So that's why we exclude inventory from the calculation over here. So we are trying to see... Does the company have enough liquid assets to settle their current liabilities? And that is the only difference between the current ratio and the asset test ratio.
then trade and other receivable days. Here's your interpretation. This ratio indicates the average number of days it takes for debtors to settle their accounts. Now guys, you want this to be as low as possible. You want to collect money from debtors as quickly as possible so that you have the money available in the business to use for business purposes or for working capital purposes. You don't want to take six months to collect money from debtors. Obviously, you want the money in the business rather. How do you calculate trade and other receivable days? You take your trade and other receivables, you divide by credit sales, and you multiply by 365. Unless you are specifically told otherwise, assume that there are 365 days in a year. Please note, guys, if credit sales is not given, you can just use total sales. And this is going to give you an answer in days. Then for inventory days, once again, here's the interpretation. This ratio indicates the average number of days that inventory is held before it is sold. And once again, you want this to be as low as possible. A company is going to want to sell their inventory as fast as possible. There's no reason to hold on to inventory for an excessively long period of time. And we calculate inventory days by taking inventory, dividing by cost of sales, and multiplying by 365. And once again, this is going to give you an answer in days. Now guys, as an alternative, instead of calculating inventory days, you can calculate inventory turnover. So this is just the inverse, where we take cost of sales and we divide by inventory. And this is going to give you an answer in times. So two times, three times, four times, five times, etc. And this ratio tells us the number of times per annum that inventory is turned into sales. Now guys, I recommend that you only perform this calculation if you are specifically asked for the inventory turnover or they give you the inventory turnover as a benchmark. So maybe they give you competitor information or industry averages, and instead of giving you inventory days, they give you inventory turnover. Then obviously you need to calculate inventory turnover. However, it's preferable to rather calculate inventory days because a little bit later we are going to calculate the cash operating cycle for the company, and you need inventory days in order to perform that calculation. Then the next ratio is trade and other payable days. So here's your interpretation. This ratio indicates the average number of days that it takes the entity to pay their creditors. And you want this to be as long as possible without ruining relationships with suppliers. And the reason why you want this to be as long as possible, guys, let's just quickly look at this on a timeline. If we look at this on a timeline, we have a company that's going to buy inventory. And at some point after buying the inventory, they are going to sell the inventory. Hopefully as quick as possible. After selling the inventory, they then need to collect the money from their debtors. Now the reason why you want trade and other payable days to be as long as possible 
is an ideal situation is you buy the inventory, you sell the inventory, you collect the money from the debtor, and after that, you use the money from the debtor to pay the supplier. So that's why you want trade and other payable days to be as long as possible, because then you can wait until you've collected the money from the debtor to pay the supplier. You don't want a situation where you need to pay the supplier over here before you've sold the inventory and before you've collected the money from the debtor, because then you're going to have to come up with some other form of short-term finance in order to pay the creditor. So you're probably going to have to use your bank overdraft, for example, to pay the creditor. So you don't want a situation like that. So that's why you want your trade and other payable days to be as long as possible. How do we calculate trade and other payable days? We take trade and other payables, we divide by credit purchases, and we multiply by 365. Once again, that's going to give you an answer in days. And please note, guys, if credit purchases is not given, you should just use cost of sales in this calculation. Then, the cash operating cycle brings together your trade and other receivable days, inventory days, and trade payable days. So you take trade receivable days, you add your inventory days, and you deduct your trade payable days. Here's your interpretation just above. The cash operating cycle indicates the time taken for cash to circulate through the business operating activities until it's converted into cash again. The cash operating cycle should be shortened as much as possible to reduce finance costs and improve profitability. All right, and this is actually linked to the timeline that I drew above. Let's add some numbers over here so that this makes more sense. Assume that trade and other receivable days is 30 days. So debtors take on average 30 days to settle their accounts. Assume that inventory days is 20 days. So the company holds onto the inventory for a period of 20 days before it's sold. And assume that trade and other payable days is 40 days. So this gives us an answer of 10 days. So if you look at this on the timeline above, the company buys the inventory. 20 days later, they sell the inventory. 30 days later, they collect the money from their debtors. But they need to pay the supplier within 40 days of buying the inventory. So when are they paying the supplier? They need to pay the supplier somewhere over here, just before they collect the money from the debtor because they need to pay the supplier 40 days after they buy the inventory. So guys, you can see the problem that we're sitting with over here is the company has to pay the supplier before they've collected the money from the data. 10 days before they collect the money from the data, they need to pay the supplier, meaning that they're going to have to use their bank overdraft or some other form of short-term finance to pay the supplier. So we want this to be as short as possible because then we have reduced finance costs and improved profitability. So the shorter this is, the lower the finance costs will be. So in this example that I provided you with over here, the company will only need to raise short-term finance for a period of 10 days. So this shows you the period that they need to raise short-term finance for. Because after that, they'll collect the money from the debtor and they'll then be able to settle their bank overdraft. So you want this to be as short as possible. You don't want a situation where your answer over here, for example, is 60 days. Because that means the company is going to pay the supplier only 60 days later they are going to collect the money from the debtor. So they are going to have to pay interest on their bank overdraft or if they're using some other form of short-term finance, interest on that form of short-term finance for a period of 60 days. That's why you want this to be as short as possible. Manax, awesome, guys. Make sure you always just understand the logic. If you understand the logic, the subject is awesome. Then, let's look at the cash ratio. Here's your interpretation. This ratio measures the entity's ability 
to utilize cash and other marketable securities to settle their current liabilities. So if you look at how we perform this calculation, we take cash and cash equivalents, we add marketable securities. So marketable securities are just investments that the company has, but they are investments that are easy to convert into cash. So the company can easily sell the investment and convert it into cash. So if they sell those investments and they use the money that's sitting in their bank account, do they have enough money available to settle their current liabilities? So you can see the interpretation comes directly from the calculation. It measures the ability of the company to use their cash and their other marketable securities to settle their current liabilities. Then lastly, operating cash flow to current liabilities. Here's your interpretation. This ratio measures the ease with which current liabilities are covered by net cash flow from operating activities. So we perform this calculation by taking net cash flows from operating activities. So that will come from the statement of cash flows and we divide by current liabilities. So we are checking if the company has enough cash from operating activities to settle their current liabilities. So it shows us the ease with which current liabilities are covered by net cash flow from operating activities. Alright guys, so then those are all of the ratios that you need to be able to calculate in the category liquidity or working capital. Please work through the lecture example to practice these calculations.